Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nancy O'Regan, and I will be a facilitator for today's People's School on the Role of Municipalities in Affordable Housing. This one is of particular interest. We've been hearing in all the Build Together work across the province about how do municipalities fit in, what is their role in this work, and so much excitement and energy coming from municipalities as they think about the ways that they can join in this really important work. Would like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered today in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, and we are grateful for the peace and friendship treaties and work to have right relations with all of our partners. So I'm going to start by welcoming our resource person and special guest today, and that's Erica Shea. Erica is the president and CEO of New Dawn Enterprises has been working in community development for 15 years. She completed degrees at Carleton University in St. Mary's, worked across Canada, and finally moved back to Cape Breton in 2012 as the Director of Communication and External Relations for New Dawn. She has led countless meaningful community projects in the last 10 years with New Dawn. We're hoping to hear a little bit of some of those as she shares her experiences with us. One of them is the purchase, renovation and revisioning of the Holy Angels High School property, which together houses four large arts organizations, meeting, presentation, event spaces, small businesses and independent artists. And one of the guiding principles that Erica does, lives her work through is the building of communities that center the dignity, worth, and well being of all people. So we're really help, happy to have Erica with us today. She'll be giving insights throughout the day. And, and at some point, she's going to do a bit of a presentation on some of her thoughts around the role of municipalities and how they connect to the community housing work. So the input that is gathered from people schools. Is, doesn't go forward sort of into you know, a plan or activities. It's really used to share the inspiration and thoughts of what people have learned from each other and their experiences and to you know, think about how to share that. So the People School recording will be on the St. of X Cody Housing Program website. It might take a few days to get up there. Some of our previous People Schools are there and you can go and have a look at those as well. So I'm just going to switch to PowerPoint for a minute and run through a couple of quick slides and then we'll get on with hearing from you. So the agenda for today, we've done a few things already. I'm going to speak a little bit about the purpose of the People's School, where it comes from. We're going to talk briefly about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030. We have a brief video we'll show. And then we really want to get into our first small group discussion about your experiences. We'll talk a bit more about affordable housing and the role of municipalities and have a second small group discussion. And then we'll share a little bit with you of what's coming up as we wrap up our sustainable development goals and affordable housing project and start thinking about what, um, what some of the other things are that are moving forward in the community housing work. So the purpose of a people school, it's a very traditional Antigonish movement approach that was started you know a long time ago had a bit of a resurgence in the ladies 80s and 90s and it's been you know used more currently by the St. of X Extension Department and now the Cody Institute as a way to bring people together around an issue that's current and that people really want to share and learn about so it's about sharing the knowledge and the experience of you first we start by going to the people in the room and asking them what's your experience what are you currently seeing or have seen. And so we build an awareness by bringing in the new, hopefully that'll be some of Erica's inputs, but also your own. And then we convene a, a space for innovation and collaboration, talking together about how, what this work looks like in your community, ways that it could be enhanced, and try to build networks and linkages. We know that following people's schools, people often connect with each other and build on what they've learned. And the idea is really to inspire action. The process of a people school is that it's a participatory method. So we use some time for individual reflection, some small group, some larger plenary group discuss discussions and decisions. It is very much about stakeholders, including first voice and having cross-sector representation. So in our case today, we're hoping we've got a cross-sector of folks that are involved in affordable and community housing, but also municipal representative. So the experience is shared between all of us. 
to make sure that we've got good outcomes that we're contributing and that we're learning from each other. We document and the process and share the results. So we're going to talk a little bit about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And we've got a fair number of folks that are familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030, but there's still some folks that aren't. And so as first timers, um, I hope that this video will be a little bit helpful for you. And those of you who have seen it again, uh, I always find that I learn a little bit more each time. Understanding the dimensions of sustainable development. By endorsing Agenda 2030 and its 17 goals, the world community has reaffirmed its commitment to sustainable development, to ensure sustained and inclusive economic growth, social inclusion and environmental protection, and to do so in partnership and peace. Agenda 2030 is universal, transformative and rights-based. It's an ambitious plan of action for countries, the UN system and all other development actors. The agenda inspires us to think creatively about the sustainability challenges of today so we can develop the right partnerships and take the right actions. At the heart of the agenda are five critical components. People, prosperity, peace, partnership, planet. These, in turn, underpin the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and are applicable in all countries. Agenda 2030 and the SDGs are not simply items on a checklist. They represent a holistic approach to understanding and tackling problems by guiding us to ask the right questions at the right time. To achieve this, we need to consider several challenges in order to work out how they connect with and impact upon each other. Finding these interdependencies helps us to address the root causes of problems and to create long-term solutions. So how does this work? Sustainable development is usually viewed through a lens of three core elements – economic growth, social inclusion and environmental protection. But it's important to remember that these are not just categories or boxes, they are connected and have aspects in common. For example, a health challenge like tuberculosis is not only determined by an unhealthy lifestyle, it could also be influenced by other factors such as poverty or air quality. To develop this approach a step further, two critical dimensions that will drive Agenda 2030 were adopted by Member States – partnership and peace. Partnerships strengthen the capacities of all stakeholders to work together. Peace, justice and strong institutions are essential for improvements in the three core areas. Genuine sustainability sits at the centre and it will be important to consider each of the SDGs through the lens of these five dimensions. Of course, we can't consider every possible angle of a single challenge. That's why it's crucial to build partnerships to share knowledge and expertise to learn how we can jointly address challenges. This requires new ways of working together focused on co-creation. National ownership is fundamental to address challenges properly. Many organizations and actors have an important role to play. Their involvement ensures long-term engagement and guarantees that no one is left behind. The universal nature of Agenda 2030 also asks us to look at the planet as one. Every country, every community has issues to address and everyone shares the responsibility and ownership to address the challenges that face us collectively. To move forward, we must develop the right capacities for Agenda 2030. We need to invest in lifelong learning to be able to advocate for change, foster action for implementation, measure progress, and to identify and empower new partners to support Agenda 2030. We all need to lead the way towards the vision of a better world within our lifetime. Because only if we ask the right questions and seek the right answers, and only if we take our responsibility seriously will we be able to achieve a truly transformational agenda, leaving no one behind. So we're going to take a few minutes and ask you if you could address a question. What are you seeing in your work in your community in the community housing sector that illustrates the role of municipal government in affordable housing and its impacts.
I wasn't aware of the fact that uh, in the case of uh, of our of our initial project, uh, no no one tenant will ever pay more than thirty percent of their monthly income towards towards rent. But then I was told that in Halifax and in other places, uh, developers have been given fairly large uh, uh, loans at, uh, at favorable rates, and they have allocated, uh, in some cases, a 5, 10, 15 percent of their units in an apartment building to affordable housing, but that they don't announce and don't, uh, don't uh, advise that, that those allocations are only good for five years or so, and that uh, uh, after those initial years are gone, that, that those so-called affordable rate, uh, apartments are, are going to be uh, going out at uh, market, market rates. And I wasn't aware of that at all. And then the other one that, that was brought up is uh, what happens if someone, uh, you know, income exceeds the guidelines on the, on the upper side, you know. And in our case, I think their rent will go up because it's 30% of their affordable income. But in some cases, they would be blocking a unit that would probably serve better some uh, uh, single mother with a couple of children or somebody like that, as opposed to maybe a single individual or a couple who combined incomes uh, for one reason or another have, have improved over time. So I'm, I'm a little bit leery. I'd like to know how people have set up their their systems and co-op housing and stuff to protect against that. Great, thank you, Bill. Um, yeah. Anyone else from group two have anything they wanted to add that you discussed in your group? It's okay. I think, um, you know, we, we, we did have that discussion on how difficult it is even entertaining going into those funding application processes if you represent a rural or even suburban area. Um, the CMHC funding uh, criteria and eligibility is so stringent and so tough that you don't even stand a chance. And even the rapid housing applications as well, it's just such an onerous process that at the municipal level, because we don't normally dive into this, this, this jurisdiction of housing, the knowledge in house, the skill set, and the ability to even understand these applications, much less fill them out to a successful point, is extremely, extremely difficult. And it doesn't help that after page one, you're essentially kicked out of the process because you just don't qualify. And what to me, what that's saying is affordable housing um, for those who live in rural communities, well, you don't qualify, figure it out on your own. And so it's a really grueling process. It certainly is. And, you know, when you we would think that maybe municipalities might have the staff skills and expertise to be able to work through those proposals. But if you think about the context of most of our community housing providers, they're volunteers. You know, and if we're lucky, you know, we'll find somebody in that volunteer group with some previous experience and expertise in proposal writing or finance, but it can be, you know, a very daunting process. So thank you for that. Uh, group one, what was your conversation like? Um, we kind of talked a lot about some of the different tools we were aware of that municipalities have, have used to, I guess, incentivize affordable housing. So things like relief on property taxes for low-income households, but also for developers that are committing to developing affordable units, um, density bonuses, uh, grants to various organizations that are working to increase supply. Uh, those were exa examples out of HRM. And then we had a good discussion on, you know, for smaller municipalities, um, how difficult it is to maybe leverage some of those, those tools. Um, they just aren't, you know, the budget just isn't there, but there are other things that can be done. Uh, anyone else from Christine's group want to add anything? Well, until she I, comes I, back. Yeah, I guess, I guess, uh, um, basically she, she some based most of what we, we talk about, but, but like my view is that, that, uh, um, we can get involved, but we can get involved where we supply, especially as smaller municipalities, we can't, we can't get involved where we supply the, the, the facilities to have to have that. I mean, we're just not uh, financially, it's not financially feasible for, for smaller municipalities to do that. But it, it seems like I've, I've, I've uh, uh, noticed that the programs are there, but it doesn't seem like the developers 
are interested in getting in in that type of a, of a of an agreement they would rather build what they can and get the the the, the rent that they the, you know the rent rents are high right now and and people are looking and people don't have any problem renting their 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 properties if 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 you if you're looking for for a, a, a place to live now, it's very very difficult. Whether it's affordable or just any kind of housing, and that's a problem not just with 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 the rural municipalities and small municipalities. This is a problem as far as I'm concerned throughout, and I don't know what the issue is, but but with with landlords right now, unless there's a, a rent controls. They are charging what they want to charge. I mean, we we had someone to build a a, um, a small complex in this area, not not in our municipality as such. But when they were done, they put it out there for bid. What are you willing to pay? And the highest bidder was getting the apartments. Wow. You know, I mean, this is it's ridiculous that that they're even allowed to do that. But but yeah. it is a problem. And as far as uh, the government, the government uh, uh, programs that that are there, we seem to. It, it seems like these programs are looked at more in the bigger areas, like the HRM and 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 the, you know, and that they're overlooking the smaller areas, whether they think there's no problem in in the in the small rural municipalities, but it's there. I mean, it may not be as big as the as HRM and 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 CBRM and wherever, and the, you know, but it is there, and and programs like that could help without going to the extent of what they do. And you know, you don't need the same extent of of uh, uh, affordable housing in these smaller rural municipalities than you do in larger ones like HRM and that. But it is there. There's definitely a problem. Certainly is. Thank you, Danny. Um, anyone from Group Three you want to share some of your comments and highlights from your discussion? I think the, we talked about the municipality acting as the convener enabler to bring the various different funding programs together, or help the not-for-profits understand how to go about getting that funding. So that that addresses the capital side, and then of course there's a role to play similarly on the land side. Uh, in order to really kind of structure a direction uh, and help and, and, and support staff, whether that's through council or otherwise, support staff bring projects to fruition rather than talking about why communities need the project. Uh, so that was one part. And I guess the other part was because of the challenge with land, with land in communities, you know, mid-sized or small, um, and the services being hard to come by outside of those areas, perhaps the municipality could also um, be there to guide locations for multi-use buildings. So incorporating physicians' offices, grocery, and all that kind of stuff. So you're really creating communities within communities. Great, thank you very much. Anyone from group four? Uh, so our group had a counselor uh, from HRM, a planner from Wolfville, a community health board uh, staff, and someone from municipal affairs. So um, we kind of identified a few different things that we're all working on, uh, respectively. So HRM has done a number of things. They've permitted accessory dwelling units in all residential zones. They've waived fees for the development of affordable housing. They have also begun a rapid housing initiative with three projects awarded so far. Um, furthermore, they provide tax relief for affordable housing and an affordable housing grant program. They're also looking at surplus land that could be used for affordable housing development. Um, it was mentioned that Acadia University along with Homeless No More which is a Valley-based nonprofit is looking at, or is conducting the second service-based count to identify people at risk of or um, currently experiencing homelessness in the area. And there may be some other municipalities around. I know Cape Breton has done so in the past. <laughs> um, 
uh, municipalities could potentially provide some funding to help support those counts happening along with the province. Um, the province is also exploring surplus land um, that could be used for affordable housing development as well as things like density bonusing. And just as we were having this conversation, I kind of realized um, I'm from the town of Wolfville, which is six square kilometers of pretty um, dense, well, not densely developed, but pretty developed land um, outside of the university lands. And uh, when we look at things like setting aside surplus land, we have about three parcels, uh, which are would require pretty intense engineering intervention to become developable. And just those sort of restrictions that were mentioned earlier in the smaller towns. And like you had mentioned as well, um, budgeting season is coming up soon. So um, really trying to fight for those small wins in the smaller municipalities. Great, Lindsay. Anyone else from group four want to add anything? Um, if I could, I think, um, again, speaking from the role of an elected official in a municipality, there is a huge role to play in being advocates. And so bringing people into the space of council chambers, and when I say people, I mean community organizations, developers, whomever, uh, it, bringing those groups together and being that advocate to bring in the funding and support from the other levels of government is it's a very, very important role. And I, I think sometimes when we, we look at what is the role of municipalities, it's, it's often monetized or based on land, but the role of advocacy is really, really important as well. Um, and I think using organizations, I think somebody is here from the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities, but also the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, using those organizations to continue that advocacy work is incredibly important and, and not to mention time consuming as well, right? And so um, there needs to be value placed on that outside of everything else that is so wonderful to hear about, you know, identifying surplus lands, um, talking about the good, the good news of legislation being passed at the provincial level that gives us a bit more uh, ability to be creative when it comes to developing affordable housing projects alongside our community stakeholders. But um, but also, I, I have to say this, as an elected official, recognizing our limitations as well, because we, we cannot be the be all and end all. Um, we, you know, Danny was mentioning it, our resources are stretched so far. We want to use our voices, we want to leverage what we have, but also recognize there's still a very important role of the provincial and federal government, and they don't get to wash their hands clean just because they put a program in place. Thank you very much for adding to that, Amanda. Um, group five, anything that you want to add that uh, came up in your discussions? This was Denise, Mary, Rob, and Wes Wesley. Anything that you want to share from your groups? Main part of our discussion was just the important role of uh, zoning and planning for municipalities, uh, going through the process of planning to make sure that the infrastructure is in place to support housing, as well as revisiting existing uh, master planning documents to make sure that they enable creation of uh, new types of communities. Um, also coordinating with, uh, with community partners is a strength that was talked about in our group. And I think that through that planning process and being in touch with uh, local community partners, makes municipalities uniquely able to know in a very specific way where the deficits are and then be able to ring those alarm bells, do that advocacy, uh, like Mayor McDougall was just mentioning. Great, thank you. Group six. I took thank a you. note, so I will start us off, but please uh, anyone else in the group can certainly add their two cents in. Um, so one of the things that we talked about was zoning. So making sure um, if there is a role to allocate some properties solely towards accessible, affordable, appropriate and safe housing and not just pricey subdivisions. Um, we also talked a lot about climate change and the role that municipalities can have in their climate change action planning. And just in advocating where properties might be being built. So thinking about creatively about vacant lots um, rather than putting forests and what lands in danger um, and just uh, playing a role in that creative building process. Another thing that came up was asset mapping and just knowing exactly what municipalities hold. So how many properties do they have? Um, how much land do they have? Just so that organizations have a sense of what their municipalities might have on hand. And we talked too about um, just the role of healthy communities and that municipalities are the hub of healthy communities. And a lot of times when things get built in a community, 
they can be seen as those people who are not wanting, you know, affordable housing or certain units there. And just that role that municipalities can play in ensuring that some of that stigma doesn't um, follow certain builds. So that came up um, certainly too. Uh, what else did we have here? Oh, and we talked as well about just as community groups and organizations needing to really support the counselors because they have so much that they deal with on a regular basis that come across their tables that they need to vote on and feel informed of. So we really felt that there could be a role for community groups to work with municipalities um, just to provide a little bit of education so that they feel more confident when they vote on certain things and put policy in place. So those were just some of the some of the key points. That's great. Thanks very much, Marcy. And I think that's all of the groups. We've got maybe another minute if there's anybody else that feels with something that missed. And then we're going to turn it over to Erica uh, to hear a little bit of her insights on what she's heard and also to share a presentation with us. But if there's anything we missed, um, please take a second now and join in. Uh, um, Celeste? Sorry, I just wanted to comment that, uh, you know, again, I keep going back to the silver lining in COVID and um, regrettably, COVID has really kind of raised this issue to a level that has not been seen before. So I see that a lot of municipalities are starting to talk about this issue, but they may not have been prior to that. So um, yeah, the urgency has presented itself in an unfortunate way, but it's good that it's be, it's urgent and it's being talked about. Great, thank you. Jimmy, um, did you wanna make a comment? And then Lynn. I'm not sure if anybody talked about active transportation and affordable transportation. Um, I, I, they may have and I missed it, but um, I think that's an other aspect of housing affordability is being able to live near enough to work, uh, at, to get to work without a car if you can't afford a car, etc. I'll just leave it at that. Great. Thank you. Lynn? Mm, uh, also, I've raised issues around equity and talked about not having engaged with the municipalities just because of partially because of the um, issues of racism that uh, municipalities themselves sometimes perpetuate. So I think there has to be real key components that address marginalized communities that are people of color and uh, Aboriginal. It's great, thank you for that, Lynn. I really appreciate your comments. I know in my own municipality of the District of Guysboro, we're very lucky to have um, a designated council seat for someone to represent our three African Nova Scotian communities of Lincolnville, Sunnyville, and Upper Big Trachity. And I'm not sure that you know the same is present across the province, but it really makes an impact here in being able to bring those voices to council on a regular basis and to make sure that those equity issues are raised all the time, which our councillor certainly does. Um, we're, I'm going to ask Erica if she would take over now and just provide some feedback on what she's heard, and then she's going to share a presentation with us. So thanks everyone for your thoughtful discussions and for sharing with the sharing some of the passion and enthusiasm you have around this issue. Erica, great, thanks so much, Nancy, and um, thanks everyone for the wonderful conversation so far. Um, three comments on what I've heard as part of your debrief, and then I'll, I'll move into the presentation. I think that we need to be letting our federal representatives and CMHC know that we are aware of the disparities between investments in urban and rural communities, and that this is data that we are going to track and pay attention to over time and start to work to hold them accountable for some more equitable investments in our rural communities. And so I think, you know, one of the things, whether it's as municipalities, as elected officials, as community groups that we can do is to reach out to our MP and ask our MPs offices to get that data for our community. So in the last 10 years, how much CMHC investment has, has come to our communities. And that may give us a bit of a benchmark uh, to work with going forward. 
I want to um, just echo a comment that Mayor McDougall made in terms of um, the, the municipal capacity to be in housing, to, to even be an advocate in the realm of housing and just acknowledge that like anything else, that is a learned skill. And I think as will become apparent in some of my slides, uh, municipal roles in housing are much more advanced in British Columbia, Ontario, and Quebec. Um, much more advanced certainly in HRM than some of the other municipalities around the province. And so there is a learning curve as our municipalities find their footing here. In just the last year, it's been really um, inspiring for us to have been invited into some conversations uh, with the town of Port Hawkesbury and Victoria County here in Cape Breton. And, and to see the passion and the urgency that our municipalities are feeling around this issue and their inclination to take action. Um, lastly, I just wanna say in terms of the comments, um, the applications for you know, CMHC and I think FCM and Housing Nova Scotia, it is, it is both the physical application and then it's the marathon. Um, it's the process that follows that, that is going to run anywhere from six months to 24 months to align different funding partners, uh, zoning, um, building requirements. And so many of our rural communities don't have either the for-profit or the not-for-profit developers who can play that role as applicant. And I think um, I'm sure there's broad agreement on this call that our municipalities don't want to be the applicant. And so I think, you know, what do we do in rural communities where we don't have that civic society capacity to function as an applicant and to take responsibility for operating affordable housing in an economic context that makes financial sustainability of affordable housing very challenging. Um, so. I will, I will move into uh, my presentation and I just, I want to start uh, just to give a little context in terms of where I come from. So I'm the CEO of Nudon Enterprises. We are a community development corporation that has operated predominantly in the CBRM over the last 35 years. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the Community Development Corporation, a parallel today would be a social enterprise. So we sometimes will call ourselves a not-for-profit social enterprise. We provide supportive housing, low market housing, commercial real estate, immigration settlement, residential care for adults with intellectual and physical disabilities. We serve uh, Meals on Wheels to 20,000 seniors in our community each year and recently opened the Eldewig Art Center in the former Holy Angels Convent. And part of wanting to set this context is uh, to assure you that I have never had either the privilege or the burden slash responsibility to serve as an elected official in a municipal government or to work as a municipal staff person. Um, and so I, I come at this topic having experienced some frustrations in my own community over the last 10 years and to feel that we need to continue to rethink the role of our municipalities. So a bit of a snapshot here in terms of the ways in which municipal governments can intervene in affordable housing. So a couple of notes, of course, this is not exhaustive. Um, it is not to suggest that there's a process, a clear process of moving from one of these to the next to the next as we'll see in some of the examples, uh, different municipalities elect to engage in different com combinations of these interventions. 
I also want to acknowledge, as was raised in the debrief, of course, that um, municipalities receive 10% of all taxes collected across Canada, and their revenues rely on regressive property taxes, which means low income renters pay more tax as a proportion of their income than high income homeowners. Um, and when I say low income renters are paying uh, more property tax, that is as a function of their rent, as part of their rent that they're, they're uh, paying. So I'm just gonna jump into each one of these in a little bit more detail. So first, and as Mayor McDougall had noted, um, one of the really important functions that a municipality can play is as an advocate. And I think that the most important step a municipality can play in advocacy is to say very publicly, clearly, and consistently that housing is a priority for our municipality. Affordable housing is a priority for our municipality. We need to say that often. We need to say that internally to staff. We need to say that externally to the community so that other decisions and policies can start to align around housing as a municipal priority. And when I say it's a municipal priority, I don't mean that it's a municipal responsibility. It's that housing is important to our constituents and we are going to champion action around housing until we start to resolve some of the places in which we're stuck as communities. So one of the ways in which our municipalities today could uh, move as advocates is to introduce a council motion to adopt housing as a human right. In the resources at the end of this presentation, there is an article specifically on recommendations for local governments who want to adopt housing as a human right. So some steps um, and what it is you are going to be accountable for by whom after making such a motion. Um, of course, there is that convening function. So bringing together our elected officials, our MLAs, our MPs, our nonprofit sector to talk about what the barriers are to affordable housing development and how we can work together to lift those barriers. I'm gonna come here to a really, really phenomenal uh, municipal housing strategy. So this is from uh, Lanark County, uh, which is um, sort of just outside of Ottawa, uh, Lanark County and the town of Smith Falls. So this is linked as well in those additional resources at the end of the presentation. But uh, one way in which a municipality can uh, make housing a priority is to pursue a municipal affordable housing strategy and or a municipal poverty strategy that speaks to the relationship between affordable housing and poverty. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna try and move more quickly here. Uh, so we can, municipalities can encourage their local chambers of commerce and economic development agencies to design and deliver education sessions around residents functioning as small scale landlords. So this may be um, through the purchase of buildings, the construction of buildings, the construction of accessory dwellings to, to talk through what being a small scale landlord looks like, your rights, your responsibilities, the funding, the financing that is available to you, the Residential Tenancies Act. I think in our communities, we want to be pursuing diverse ownership of our rental housing. So we don't want our rental housing owned by just a couple of developers, whether those are for-profit or not-for-profit. A diversity of ownership of affordable housing is ideal. And the last point I wanna make here, um, I mean, this is something that we are certainly seeing firsthand in the CBRM. Our 
our universities are expanding and I could I could get up from my chair and jump for joy. This is such a positive economic, social and cultural development for our communities, but it really does put pressure in the short term on our existing housing stock. And so uh, just some uh, numbers here. So in Canada, universities provide housing for about 3% of their students. In the US and the UK, universities provide housing for 20 to 30% of their students. In Canada, we have about 1.5 million university students and we have 120,000 housing units owned by post-secondary institutions. So municipalities can, as their universities and colleges are growing, really encourage those institutions who, as their enrollment grows, their financial standing improves, and have conversations about this shared responsibility uh, for student housing in particular. Got a couple of examples here uh, from the HRM. And so one of the uh, interesting um, elements of the work that the HRM has done around housing, affordable housing and homelessness is uh, you can go back to 1997 and you can really look at this history of advocacy, a period of advocacy and study and strategy that went on for about a decade before it started to translate into financial investments, incentives, and action. Uh, and so I think it is a wonderful example of how important that advocacy is and how that advocacy um, does help us to acquire skills, language, understanding, and then in some cases to move to some more concrete actions. We'll talk about uh, municipal zoning, which came up in the debrief. So of course, one of the roles uh, played by municipalities in the realm of affordable housing is uh, zoning. And zoning answers the question, what can go where? and what conditions do we place on certain developments? And so here, um, two components, there is the removal of exclusionary zoning. In Canada, approximately 65% of lands in municipalities are zoned only for single detached homes. For many people in our communities, the ownership of a single detached home is way out of their reach. We can encourage our municipalities to uh, revisit their existing zoning policies and documents and look at how they can remove exclusionary zoning. So open up some of those communities, areas, regions, two accessory dwellings, multi-unit buildings, tiny home communities. That is part of setting a context for the flourishing of different kinds of housing in our communities. And then of course, there's the adoption of inclusionary zoning. So in October, 2021, uh, Nova Scotia amended the MGA to allow municipalities to advance or implement policies around inclusionary zoning. And so that means that a municipality can say all new developments in our municipality or all new developments in a particular community must have 10% of their units as affordable and affordable means 30% of a tenant's um, monthly or annual income. If a developer is developing a really small scale development, maybe they're only building a duplex, maybe they're not building a, a 12 story high rise with 140 units, they're building a duplex. And so municipalities can say, in place of providing 
10% affordable units, developers can make a monetary contribution to a housing reserve fund, and the municipality can later draw money from that fund to support other affordable housing projects in the community. Geesh, I keep going back and forth, back and forth. Um, so some really interesting examples here. Um, so the city of Vancouver making a policy change in the elimination of exclusionary zoning, allowing for the construction of up to six affordable housing units on properties where previously only one single detached home existed. And they anticipate that this will bring more than 10,000 new affordable homes into the community. Uh, I think more recently and more locally, uh, Kings County, Nova Scotia uh, Council adopting some amendments to particular zones to allow a greater diversity of dwelling types in those zones. Not surprisingly, changes particularly around exclusionary zoning and opening up some of our existing neighborhoods to different dwelling types are going to require anywhere from modest to significant community education about why we have to take collective responsibility for ensuring that we have accessible, affordable housing in our communities. Municipalities can make contributions of land in kind. They can contribute particular plots of land. They can set up land trusts, which says these six parcels of land must in perpetuity be used for affordable housing. They can set up land banks which are not as restrictive as land trusts. And so you may not have affordable housing provided in perpetuity when somebody accesses that land for affordable housing development. It may be uh, a not-for-profit organization can access land in a land bank to build a development and it will be affordable for 25 years rather than uh, in perpetuity. I think there's an important role that municipalities can play in terms of assembling land for larger developments. And so they can help uh, organizations to assemble lands that are owned in part by the province and in part by the federal government and in part by private developers and in part by the municipality to create a parcel that is big enough to warrant or to host a substantial investment. Waiving uh, building fees and development fees can be significant in some developments. And I'll note here that this is a requirement of CMHC's co-investment fund, that the municipality be a contributing partner and that they waive um, some of the municipal fees on developments that are going through the co-investment fund. Municipalities can make capital contributions to new affordable housing developments. And they can also approve property tax exemptions. It's much more rare for a municipality to directly provide an operating contribution or a grant to an affordable housing project uh, in an ongoing manner. I will say as an organization that provides affordable housing and supportive housing in the community, it has been our experience that property tax exemptions are more valuable than capital contributions. It is somewhat easier at this particular moment in time to assemble the capital to start a project. The challenge becomes its financial sustainability over the next 25 years. 
And so a full or partial property tax exemption can go a really long way in allowing projects to attain that financial sustainability. Some magnificent Nova Scotian examples here. So New Glasgow uh, provided a 20 year property tax exemption on the uh, relatively recent Cody's Place development by the Nova Scotia Co-op Council um, and HRM uh, providing streamlined and predictable multi-year property tax relief for registered nonprofits, charitable housing groups. In Nova Scotia right now, it is legally not possible for a municipality to create a municipal housing corporation to own and operate affordable housing. Municipalities can create municipal housing corporations, but there is a very specific spectrum of tenants that they can then house in those units. A couple of other sort of miscellaneous regulatory ways in which municipalities intersect with this area of housing. The monitoring of short-term vacation rentals. So there is a mandatory provincial registry for short-term vacation rentals. Properties who do not register in this registry can be subject up can be subject to fines up to $7,500 a year for failing to register. Municipalities can help around the awareness and education of this registry. And then they can, looking at the registry, they can track the number of locations, size, growth, and implication of these short-term rentals over time and, and consider whether they need to introduce some new zoning restrictions around where or at what scale these rentals can um, uh, be constructed in the community. Some municipalities, so here again, HRM, um, inspection of rental accommodations, so not, not short-term vacation uh, accommodations, but um, affordable housing, market housing, the inspection of units to make sure that they're consistently meeting minimum building code, that they are safe places for people to live. Um, and in uh, 2019, HRM Council moved to make public violations of uh, building code uh, for those landlords who consistently uh, fail to adhere to those codes or to make improvements to their buildings to bring their buildings in line with those codes. I think, I think for me, um, as we think about, as we think about the changing role of municipalities and as our municipalities are asking themselves the question, what is our role? How can we be useful here? I think we need to move beyond asking well, what can we do at minimal cost with our existing tools to confronting the depth and the nuance of the challenge our communities have around affordable housing? So we need to ask ourselves, what is the problem? What is the current state? Who is struggling with housing? Why and where are they struggling with housing? What is our goal as a community? How many affordable housing units would we like to be adding each year to our community and for how many years? There's going to be many players, provincial, federal, nonprofit, private sector, who have to come together in the achievement of those targets, but a municipality can articulate those targets, can bring together the, the research to give us some numerical benchmarks to work towards. And they can then look at um, what are the policies, incentive, incentives, zoning changes, and advocacy that needs to happen to get us from our current state to our desired future state. This is a much more 
active, proactive approach than relying on the tools that already exist, kind of dusting them off a little bit and representing them to the communities. Our communities have changed so much in the last 10 years. Uh, we really have to be willing alongside of our municipalities to get into the, the details and the dirt of this, uh, where, we're, where, we're, where we seem to be stuck here. I, I just wanna close by noting that in the 2022 federal budget, there was $4 billion announced to build municipal capacity in the affordable housing sector. So as of today, uh, there, there are still not many more details available on what this could look like, what that funding could be used for. They have um, written about it in fairly broad terms. This is copied directly from the 2022 federal budget. So perhaps um, when you're calling your MP to ask for some data on CMHC investments in your community, uh, you, can, you can ask when they expect this fund to be released. Um, and then um, some, of the, some of the documents sort of referenced uh, throughout these slides. Um, I suspect I've gone over time. I'm so grateful for your patience um, and your interest. And I will stop sharing my screen. Well, Erica, thank you so much. Um, so many things to think about in terms of looking at what the role of municipalities could be, is, has been historically. Um, we certainly have seen municipalities more and more as this, not just COVID, but as this housing crisis has progressed, get more and more interested in, and, uh, you know, asking for ways they can help and ways that they are enabled to help through levels of government and through their mandate. So it's it's uh, pretty exciting to see so many folks coming to the conversation, thinking about ways that that can happen. And so in the time that we have left today, we're going to ask you to go back into small groups. And I think two questions for this one. The first one is really, how can municipal government support the development of affordable housing in your community? And the second, is what could happen in your community to ensure that no one is left behind, which is the target for the sustainable development goals and United Nations target is around not leaving anyone behind. What needs to happen so that we don't leave anyone behind? This time I'm gonna go backwards. We'll start with group six and ask you what was one aha moment you had in your conversation? Um, yeah, uh, first of all, I just wanted to let everyone know that Mayor McDougall had to leave because she's uh, on the board of the Cape Breton Community Housing Association, which among other things, operates the shelter here. So she had to go do the work that we're talking about. Um, I'm, I'm gonna fill out that form to provide our group's feedback and, in, and then instead let Angela use our time right now to um, mention it, the point that she brought up, Angela. Uh, thanks, Mike. I, I just shared with the group uh, my my thoughts on the role of the the private sector, and uh, I they should focus on providing market housing, and that we uh, need to really build up the community housing sector, whether it's a, a rental organization like I work with, or the co-op center, uh, or the many other models and the private sector where they can help, they pay attention to their corporate social responsibility uh, commitments is in providing advice, uh, support and guidance to nonprofits until they're uh, large enough and, and strong enough and employ their, their own staff. If we look to them to provide affordable housing, it's a short-term measure. And I don't believe we're ever going to, uh, well, not in my lifetime, that we have um, uh, equality where everyone can access uh, market housing with, without support. We are always going to have an affordability issue and our sector is the only one that can address it. 
Great. Thank you very much, Angela. Um, group five. Well, this is my own aha moment. Uh, others may have a different uh, perspective, but I mean, we talked a lot about, you know, making sure that um, the conversations that are happening have a way to appropriately and authentically include people with, who are experiencing housing challenges. Quite often, those of us that are sitting around talking about it are not the ones that are unhoused. So we have to really make sure that their voices are heard and that there is dignity in, in, in how they contribute to the conversation. And the other aha is that we can't talk about housing of any type, whether it's affordable, safe, adequate, or appropriate housing, if we don't stop start talking about poverty. Because the underlying cause for most, afford most affordability challenges in housing is poverty. So we have to have these conversations in tandem. Great. Thank you, Celeste. Group four. Hi, I, I took a few notes. Um, I was going to bring those up here. Um, I think an aha moment on the, especially on the number three, the uh, to ensure no one is left behind, is really identify who is being left behind. I think that I know that was a bit of an aha moment for me, and it was a great point brought up. Um, where, where, and how. Um, is municipal government supports an affordable housing and community? Where in the globe is that working? And how do we learn about those projects and adapt them to our own areas? Great, thank you. Yeah, it's really about the ability to share resources and knowledge and best practice as we hear about it with others. The next group, group three. I can speak to that. Um, so uh, one of the things that that we discussed was uh, the overwhelmingly strong influence of, of developers and how uh, you know even when they come into a project, if the, the project is is not in line with what the developer wants to do, oftentimes uh, they they use their influence to, to get their way anyhow, and it's creating situations where you'll have a single developer become a single tenant in in a large city or even a smaller community. Uh, further to that, uh, we we discussed, um, you know, possibly providing uh, incentive for new builds and even existing builds to become more resistant to climate change, whether that's to mandate that new builds are off grid or net net zero uh, carbon emissions, or a tax incentive to <clears throat> make your your home off off grid. And further to that, um, affordability in housing is not just the cost of the building. It's you know what supports are around those builds <clears throat> in terms of public transportation, access to essential services like uh, medical appointments, dentist appointments, food, recreation, and all those things that help people thrive and not just uh, survive. Great, thank you very much, Chris. In group two. Sure, um, I, I think it's it was echoed by a number of the different groups, but I think if it was as obvious as um, and plain as we think it is, then likely we wouldn't have the affordable housing challenges that we have. So our feedback was that the conversation sh every day should have affordable housing as part of it at all levels. And that hopefully that if that happens, that it will then prompt change in the various different areas. And it shouldn't just be focused on one part of the continuum within the municipality or the city or whatever the group is, but it should really be thought of as, as all parts from shelter right through to affordable housing. Great, thank you very much, Mike. And the final word today goes to group one. Hi, yeah, thanks, Nancy. Um, we had a really great conversation and kind of discussed around like, um, how can we make sure that residents in our communities aren't left behind and we discussed like some of these conversations that are taking place between organizations and uh, communities in the municipality it needs to be a more inclusive space and I think Celeste brought up that point that the current conversations that we're having even in today's conversations um, are they representative of the the demographics and individuals who are being, you know, impacted most by this situation of the housing crisis. 
And so creating those inclusive spaces. And then we also just discuss ensuring that accessibility is always in mind and that we need to kind of find those solutions that will help us create the greatest good um, and not find individual solutions, but kind of, you know, looking at it as a broader, a broader problem. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Erica, any quick insights on this last round? Yeah, two thoughts, I think, um, that, that relate to what's been shared. I think it's really important as municipalities uh, to step into specific interventions or incentives um, that they take both the responsibility for and power of defining what is affordable for how long and for whom. Um, that is uh, uh, an important part of the municipality's participation in affordable housing. What defines affordable housing? How long does it have to be provided for? Um, and are there any um, target populations that um, need to be housed most urgently in exchange for land or fees being waived or grants or tax exemptions? Um, and I think, you know, my aha moment, uh, Nancy, was, was our, our chat in between these sessions and just uh, listening to you talk about Guysboro County and thinking about how um, especially invisible rural poverty can be. Great, thank you. Kelly, if you could prepare to just share a bit on the asset map you've been working on, and then we should be able to wrap up pretty quickly. Okay, so we looks like we've got 33% are very familiar now, which is up from very much from the first survey poll, somewhat familiar at 56 and not at all familiar still at 6%. So I think we've certainly seen some shift and some learning about what the sustainable development goals mean and how it's connected to affordable housing. And for us around the role that municipalities can play in moving those targets forward. So thank you. Thanks so much, Nancy. So this is tracking um, our community housing sector. Um, it's foundational work that as custodians of this, of this space, we're really building um, a sense of community, of connectedness, that we are prepared to move forward together. About 100 uh, groups, organizations, networks, coalitions, cooperatives have, have answered th this call to how these six um, SDGs are directly um, framing their local action. And so from a municipality's perspective, championing this space to connect with community, but also to build opportunities together um, is, is a type of vision for this, for this map, which will be launched uh, this time next week at the Nova Scotia Nonprofit Housing Association's founding meeting. Thanks. Great, Kelly, looking forward to it. Um, want to sign off by really, really thanking Erica. I mean, your presentation just had so much in it. And I could, you know, I see it's just brought lots of conversation out and lots of different ways to be thinking about how municipalities can support the community housing sector and moving forward on measures of affordable housing and how we approach that. Um, really looking forward to sharing these notes with all of you and then being able to hear more about this as we move forward with the Nova Scotia Nonprofit Housing Association. Our founding meeting will be next week in Antikonish. We have two days planned um, to talk through some things like governance and membership and an action plan moving forward. And then really looking at the role that um, our regional housing networks will play. And that's really where municipalities can really become part of the conversation by you know, assisting by joining those regional housing networks, being part of bringing that understanding to more areas and regions in the province and really looking at ways to partner with the, what we call the boots on the ground. You know, the folks that are, are in community really working hard on housing. So thank you for all of your efforts today, for all of your comments and really appreciate everyone's thoughtfulness and conversation today. So thank you.